talking all the time. But it, it starts getting really boring for people who are listening. It is my experience that I thought I should share with you. This is not, uh, I'm not too much into the academics, but mostly whatever I have learned through environmental sciences, doing my master's in environmental science, is what we have been trying to implement in or rather practice. So one is that I have been given this opportunity to share some of these activities and how we went about you know, conducting these activities, implementing programs and projects. To give you a brief you know, introduction about EcoWatch, the organization that I am working for, it has been there for the last 25 years now, since 1996, 97 onwards. But we have been working, we started with the environmental awareness and the education programs, mostly creating awareness, sensitizing students, uh, really college, schools, uh, various other institutions. We started with these, basically with the environmental awareness, which was very much required then. But then later on we found out that you know, not only awareness wasn't, uh, I mean, it was not sufficient. So people know about it. You know there is too much of air pollution. You know water is contaminated. So what are you going to do about it? Is there anything that you are going to do? Yes, we are aware, we know about it. Bangalore's air is polluted, Mumbai's air is polluted, Delhi's number one, you know, top pollution chart in the country. All this information awareness is fine. It is important, I'm not saying it is not. But after that, what do we do? Because whenever we went to uh, you know, institutes, schools, colleges, like CMR, way back when we used to go to schools and colleges, talk to them, why do we need to protect the environment? What is the need? I mean, how is it going to sustain us? Why is it important for us to protect these water resources, rivers, ponds, lakes, groundwater? They started asking us, yes, we are aware, what do we do? Have you done anything? Can you show us what you have done? Is there anywhere that we can go and see that, okay, this is the lake that you have rejuvenated. This is the pond that you have cleaned and uh, you know, restored. These are some of the lung spaces or some forest areas or some of the green spaces that you have uh, you know, established. Is there anything like that where we can go and see what has to be done? That is when we realized that just talking about it is not going to do anything. I mean, we are not going to go anywhere. We are only going to keep talking about it, create awareness, sensitize people. Yes, important, but on ground. When we talk about environment, sustainability, you know, green, uh, whatever the, the uh, what do you call as the green washing. I mean, that is a different thing. But when we talk about environment, sustainability, environment protection, natural resources, what is it that we have to do? That is what is extremely important right now. In fact, we are too late. I'm sure people, I mean, students here are from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, some of them maybe, right? At least from different parts of the country. So the problem is the same everywhere. It is either about air pollution, it's on either water contamination, or it is something to do with waste management. We still don't know how to say it. We are a global technology hub and we still don't know how to segregate our waste. It is a matter of shame now, that's it. And we, you know, our so-called government machineries, those who are working on this, they have to go to Singapore, they have to go to Sweden to learn about this, about waste management, how do you treat different types of waste. So these are the problems that exist anywhere. Wherever there is civilization, wherever there is industrialization, we are bound to have all these problems. But who is going to take care of it? No, not only organizations like us. We can't take care of this whole thing. It is impossible. Until and unless you support, it is impossible for us to either manage or address these issues. So that's when we started realizing that implementing certain things on the ground, showing people, because that was what was very important, 
and they said, can you show what do we what what do we need to do? School children started asking us, okay, now we know we are aware of pollution. I think there is too much of air pollution. What do we do? What kind of plants are we supposed to plant? You can't just go and plant everything everywhere. There are species which are you know native, those which are endemic to Bangalore. You can't plant the same things in Chennai, you can't plant the same things in Delhi. There are different species. Some of them may be very common, but not all. We have to understand these things. What are the species that we need to grow? How long do we have to maintain them? If you have to take care of the water resources, it's very easy, you know, to just blame the government is not doing this, the government is not taking care. It is very easy. Isn't it? When something goes wrong, we say BBP has not done this. Or the roads are bad. Yes, they are responsible to an extent. But how long are you going to go on pointing fingers at them? You are the one who has elected them. You elected them, right? They have not forcefully come here and said, we will rule you. You have given your vote, you have cast your vote, you have elected them as your representatives. So it is their duty to address these issues. So at the same time, it is also your responsibility, I mean our responsibility, to see that you do not pollute. Sometimes it says, what will happen to one person if I change, what, what is going to happen? So if everyone says the same thing, then it's never going to change. So these are some of the environmental problems. See, Bangalore faces a lot of problems with respect to water. Do you know where we get water from? Anybody? So I don't want this to be you know, a one-way, one-sided talk. Please. If you have anything, please share. Not that I know everything. I don't know. If there is anything that you know, please share something. If you think there is something else that we can do, organizations like us, institutions like you, can collaborate and do certain things, please share those things. I mean, I would love to hear those. If we can implement, we'll be very glad to take it up. So if you all know, do you all know where Banino gets its water from? Anybody? Yeah, please. River Kaveri. Are you are you all aware of River Kaveri? Kaveri River, all of you know about it. <coughs> sorry, I have a slightly bad throat. I'm sorry. You know about River Kaveri, right? All of you know. Most of you know. Few of you know. So this is the main water source for Bangalore. But where is Kaveri River located? Where is it situated? I mean, where does it flow? Anybody? Kaveri River is about 120 kilometers from here. We are drawing water from River Kaveri that is situated. It starts off near Kurg, Barkara, Kodaru district, and then flows across Karnataka to the Western Ghats region and then goes towards Tamil Nadu. Right? We have the conflict of using water between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka all the time. Either when there is too much water, they release water, and there is a problem. In summer, there is no water, then again, there is a problem. So this entire city, 75% of us depend only on the river Tabe. The rest, 25%, do you know where it comes from? Well, I am asking you this because, see, these are the basics that you should know. Whichever city you go to, you are, you are in Bangalore, I am talking to you about Bangalore. If you go to Mumbai, you should know where this water is coming from. How much water are you getting from where? How much are you supposed to conserve? How much are you supposed to use? These are the basics that you should know. So the remaining 25% of water in Bangalore comes from where? Ground water. Exactly. The remaining 22% comes from ground water. 22 to 23 percent of the groundwater. So imagine 23 percent for a population of 1 crore and 35 lakhs that we have. 1 crore 35 lakhs, it's still growing every day. We are dependent. So how much of groundwater are we going to use? Are we using every day? This is on a daily basis, I tell you. It's not an annual or monthly or weekly. Every day we need 1,600 million liters per day. That is what every day it is called. 1,600 to 1,700 MND million liters per day. 
of water by your bills to cater to its population of 1 crore 35, 37 lakhs. So imagine out of this fresh water, every day that you use this 1600 million liters, 35% is waste, either through leakages during supply or there is there are chances that it is not distributed properly, leakages, and after all that you consume about 65 to 70, 60 to 65 percent of the water is what you consume. 35 percent is wasted. Out of this water that you consume, you consume in the sense drinking, cooking. 50 percent is for again toilets, bathing, cleaning, gardening. So it's only about 500 to 3, 4, 400 to 500 million liters per day that you actually consume. Rest is all for your other needs, which can actually be compensated by various recycled or treated water. In fact, we don't have more than about 1,200 lakes. We don't have them anymore. We just have about 30 to 40 of them, 50 at the most today. Rest of them are all now malls, bus stands, residential areas, commercial complexes. We have all covered everything. We have completely destroyed them and we have all these malls. And then when it starts raining heavily, it starts flooding, then you say, what did the BPP do? So who are you going to catch hold of? If, you're, if you blame the BPP, you, you you think your water problems will be solved? Not, this, they are only, it is only going to worsen the situation. Because there is no proper development plan for any of the cities for that matter. Bangalore also doesn't have any development. It is all there on paper. When you start implementing, it is not. Some MLA comes, this is my ward, leave this side. He has to please his voters. He will say, okay. The road will be diverted. Suddenly the metro comes, metro somebody else says, this is some inflation like up there, he will say there are institutions here, we have com commercial complexes, you have to divert the metro. So is this how we are going to develop? Why I am giving you all these examples are, this is environment, you know, when you talk about environment, it is not just about going, planting trees, hugging trees, you know, walking and sitting on the trees and playing music and no, it is much more beyond all these. You have to actually get your hands dirty in the sense you have to start working on environmental issues. It may be on water. Water means you have to take care of your lakes, water bodies, ponds, groundwater. You cannot go on, you know, completely in. There is absolute disregard, neglect, and there is no respect at all. You think somebody else is going to do this job? Do you all segregate waste wherever you stay, whether PGs or homes or is there any proper waste segregation that happens? Yes? No? I know it's quite cold, you all know, must be very sleepy. Yes or no? No, I didn't mean the sleepy part. I said about the segregation part. No segregation. No, you can be honest, I'm not going to find you, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm, I just want, we are carrying out a survey on the waste management. You know, at the institution level what happens, at the residential level what is happening, at the commercial level what happens, hotels, shops. You know what is the awareness levels of people and these are so-called educated, literate, class category that I am talking about. Now we talk. We have been conducting this for the last one year intermittently. These are the people who we have found. Those who are actually, those who actually do not segregate. Those who don't even know that you have to segregate. The other thing is they don't know what happens if you do not segregate. Fine, that is at the later part, but at least keeping paper, plastic, glass, metal, organic waste. This is a very basic segregation method or system that you should all know. 
So, how many of you actually segregate waste wherever you stay? So, into paper, plastic, organic waste. What happens to the organic waste? Paper, plastic, I can understand. Somewhere or there, the dry waste, you know, the center will come and collect, the Diwala will come, Kabar Diwala will come, newspaper will go there, plastic, plastics will go. What about the organic waste? Use it as compost. All of you? Maybe. If not all, at least 50% of you would be doing that. So is, does it go into some kind of a garden or a pot or a plant? Somewhere it goes, right? But the same thing does not happen with the other kind of waste. And you have batteries, you have cell phone, all the everything related to the cell phone, laptops, the electronic waste. Is there anywhere that you go and drop off these electronic waste? Chroma. Anywhere else? If there is no chroma, what happens? At the institution? Here? No, is there a collection center? You can, it can be a collection center. See, I am not trying to demean anybody or anyone or any institution or any association for the matter. I am just trying to see. We also need to know because things are changing so fast. 15 years ago when we actually started working, I did not have a cell phone. There was no question of electronic waste because I should have either come back to my office and started working on the desktop because I didn't even have a laptop then. So today it's like a basic necessity. You need to have that wherever you go. So things have changed, lifestyles have changed. So all this background I'm giving here is because it has to be addressed not just at your own level. It's, it starts from you, yes, but then it also has to finally, eventually end at your city or the national level or at the international level. So there are different types in if we adopt what do you mean by sustainable development? No, anybody can answer. It need not be a perfect answer. I just, I just want to know what, what is your understanding of sustainable development? Yeah, development should be, uh, you know, in the long run, it will be sustained. Like, it's not just for at the moment, but even in the future, it's going to be there, that kind of development. Exactly. So, whatever that you are going to develop, right now what Babylon is going through is completely unsustainable. We are unable to manage the people here. We are unable to cater water to them. You can't provide jobs to everyone. There is no proper housing facility, sanitation. All these things, see these are all environmental problems. It is not just about lakes and you know bees, butterflies, garden. No, when we talk about environment, these are the issues that we need to concentrate today. It was, these issues were back then about 20 years ago, but these have changed. So if you have to develop any city, any area, any village for that matter, you need to have a plan, you need to have various policies intact, and you should go by those policies. There are different laws. You should all be, I think, I'm sure they must all be learning about various environmental laws, right? You all study about various environmental law, Policies, your Water Conservation Act, Air Pollution Prevention Act, Solid Waste Management, Segregation, the Acts, Noise Pollution, Wildlife Act is there. Are you all aware of these acts and you know, rules, laws, policies? So there are different policies. I mean, some are policies, some are laws, some are rules, regulations. But in, in general, if you are talking about sustainable development, we have to even look at the global picture as well. Today, you know what is happening in Egypt? COP27, Conference of Parties, 27 Conference of Parties that is happening. Where is it happening? What, 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 what do you know about COP27 or Conference of Parties in general? What is this conference of parties? Why does it happen? So, 
what's going to be the plan next 20, like 2030 or 2050, what plans are going to adopt? Right. So, I'm sure all of you know about this. Please answer it for all of you. But the whole thing is about how different countries should mitigate air pollution, your carbon emissions, how you bring down, what are the latest technologies. And at the same time, there are some countries, like for example the US. I'm not criticizing them. See, they have developed in a different way. They are not like India, we are not like them. Their usage of resources has been extreme. They have extremely exploited or exploited their resources. But now they are very smart. They don't want to use any more of their resources. They are dependent on all the other countries. They don't mind paying a hefty price, but they want to save it for their future generations. But what about others? So there are different countries. Some of them have green technologies. They come and share these technologies. Some of them have clean technologies, CDM, the clean development mechanism. It comes under the CDM uh, policies framework under the United Nations, UNFCC, that is for climate change. So this conference of parties, which is going on right now, it has been happening for the last 25, 30 years. But most of them who have come there, see, it didn't happen in the last two years because of COVID. It was all online, but now that people are able to travel, people are not really afraid of you know, the coronavirus and COVID anymore. So now it is happening in Egypt. And you know how many of them have gathered there? So many of them have gathered. There are more than 1,000 delegates were there. Out of that, it is calculated that 400, some of the big corporates, government officials, there are 400 jets, private jets, that have flown into Egypt. And we talk about climate change. It is a shame. Yes, this is in the news today. It has been there in the news. They have emitted so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that it is. it will take another 75 years, even if you start right from today, it will take about 75 to 80 years to pull down these carbon emissions that have happened because of these 400 private jets that have flown into Egypt for conference of parties, COP27. And we talk about you know, addressing climate change. Our Prime Minister is also there. He's trying to do certain things, but there are other people who are saying we cannot cut down on the emissions. So that is when the carbon trading comes into picture. And these are all gimmicks, I feel. US, United States is saying we cannot cut down because we cannot compensate, we cannot for, you know, forego the luxuries of our people. They are used to a certain standard of luxury and comfort. We cannot you know, cut down. We can't ask them, instead of using a huge SUV, you know, start using a multi and so we can't tell them. It's a democratic country. And we are not in, we have the right. But you also have the right not to pollute. You cannot go on polluting at somebody else's expense or cost. You can't have a very lavish lifestyle. So such countries will say, we will give India 100 million, 200 million dollars. You take up planting, you offset the carbon emissions, and we will pay for that. Our people are very happy. They are making huge money. And then the deforestation happens clean development mechanisms are in place, new technologies, green technologies are in place or not, who's checking? The government has to do that. If the government is not doing it, then who is going to watch over that? So, it is a big web. You know, it's a very complicated, intricately complicated. So, these countries, such are the countries who are saying we cannot cut down our carbon emissions. So, what do you do? Because conference of parties does not have any binding law or rule from the countries. They can only share, they can only come up with new aspects, new ideas, new technological interventions. So then they, it is not binding on them. They say we will not, they take an oath saying we will do this. But it is not something like if you don't wear a helmet, you are fine, you can go to jail, your license will be taken away. If there is something like that, then they will do that. 
So who's going to check them? All the governments are sitting there and talking about this. So who's going to have any kind of a binding rule or law or policy at that level? Nobody. And the big countries themselves are saying, we, can't, we cannot afford more and we will pay you some money so that you can take up environmental restoration programs, carbon offset projects. That's what is happening. So they are all under, you know, shape right now because of how people, people are saying you could have had it as a webinar. Why did you have to have so many people flying, flying into Egypt? Imagine, the, I'm talking about the 400 checks. How many of them are to stay there? Their food, water, electricity for these people who are staying there, power, they all have laptops, mobiles, all these gadgets are going to be used. How much of power is being consumed? See, this, this is what, when you talk about sustainable development, I think there are seven major policy level, at, at the policy level, seven major things that we need to keep in mind. First of all, it is the reduction of poverty. <coughs> I don't mean poor people do not have a good life. It is not just because, you know, poverty doesn't just mean that you are going hungry. So there are certain things, that it, there's a certain level of poverty. In fact, being poor is much better for the environment, because you don't abuse the resources. Here, what they talk is people, when, when everyone is not skilled like you, but there are people, they are born, you can't kill them. Just because they don't work, they don't have any skills, you can't, you know, go on killing people. So first of all, to reduce poverty, that is to engage them in environmental restoration activities. That is the first one. So reducing poverty means engaging them, giving them employment in environmental restoration where there is no much skills required. It may be agroforestry, it may be afforestation, it may be reforestation, it can be lake restoration, waste management, little bit of training is required, that's it. They don't need, you know, high-tech degrees and all that. The second thing is to remove all the subsidies. You know what subsidies are? Yes? No. I don't know whether this generation knows about subsidies. Do you know? Yes or no? I can't hear you. So power is given free, fertilizers are given free, water is given free. You start giving everything free just because, okay, it is a farmer. I'm not saying you should not. But the problem is, it is misused, overexploited. They will just leave the water. They say there is no power six, eight hours a day. And then they leave the water on. Whenever the you know, power comes, let it water the fields. But that water, that motor will be on for the next eight hours until the power is there. Whether the crop requires water or no, it goes on pumping water into that. So, power is wasted, water is wasted. So, the second thing is about removing the subsidies. We used to get subsidy for our LPG cylinders, gas, right? Now, there is no subsidy. I mean, it was a voluntary act. That's it. If you want to give up subsidies, you can. I think it should be made mandatory now. That there should be no subsidy. I think it is on the verge of making it mandatory that you run. Yes, it's what? It's a natural resource. You can't go on giving subsidies for all these things just because they are not at certain standard of living point. No, you can't. You are going to misuse the resources or exploit, which otherwise could have been used elsewhere. The third thing is about market-based economics, market-based approaches. If I am buying a cell phone, if it is being produced with additional amount of resources, I have to pay more. The industry will have to pay more if they are polluting too much. It is a concept of polluter pays. Somebody has to pay, right? Either you have to pay or the company has to pay. The company will put it on you. You are going to pay that. But now suddenly there are other, you know, products which come at a lower cost. Cheaper. So what happens to that? There is again the subsidy linked to that. Because somebody else is paying. You give it at a cheaper cost. So the resources are being used. So you buy thousand of those cell phones which are ten thousand bucks. 
Whereas you'll buy about 10 phones which are about 25, 30, 40,000 rupees. So if you have a market-based approach, either, so what they're saying is, it has to be split between the consumer and the producer, which makes sense. Now you say it is very costly, it is expensive. Buy it only if you need it. Why do you have to buy just because you are front as an Apple iPhone, you also want an iPhone. Somebody else is bring it from US, you also want it. Do you really need it? This is a question that we need to ask. I mean, if we are talking about sustainable development, the policies, these are the issues. This is how it is going to be. The fourth thing is, provide incentives, especially economic incentives. This is another policy which even the COP27 is thinking about. I mean, they have been thinking about this, but it has not been implemented yet. It is about providing, suppose I have an industry, and if I am polluting X amount of whatever, the water, no chemical influence, I have to treat it. If I can reduce that by 25%, 30%, the government is going to provide more incentives to me for bringing down the pollution level. So the industry gets paid more for that. They will also not charge you more. But these are the economic incentives. The other thing is about how global efforts are made. Well, that is one example is COP27. But I don't know what is going to happen. After this COP27, God knows what will be the outcome. Because nobody is there. Nobody is able to take the binding laws. They don't want to frame also. Eventually it is the, and then the final one will be the awareness levels. Who is going to create awareness about what? And what is its impact on? You see, these are the broad framework, policy framework of sustainable development. But if you have to, if you have to really start implementing the sustainable development mechanisms or methods, It has to come actually from within. The coverage should be much more stricter. If you are polluting, you will have to pay for it. Right? Yes or no? Yes? Sleepy already. Why sleepy? Okay. Now, if there is anything that you would like to share, see, this is. It has to be interactive. I don't want to you know, stand here and keep addressing you and you eventually get bored, you start sleeping. I know it. We have also gone through this. Right? So if, if you have anything that you want to share, please let me know. We can actually have a discussion about it. It can be anything on water, it can be something on industries, it can be about waste management can be anything to any, any environmental issue that you have in mind. If there is anything, please let me know. Or should I pick each one of you? No. Anybody? No. All of you? Like help in you know raising awareness or you know doing something for the environment itself. Like how can we you know, like join with somebody like who's actually into it all this? So we can help us and you know, doing this. See, there are so many ways that you can help us. Now if you want to help us, then you will also have to be a model, first of all. I mean to say model in the sense. Right? You need to practice whatever that you want to preach. See, when I say something about waste management, am I doing it at home, first of all? No, am I using any transport that is not polluting? See, I have to use a transport. I definitely have to use. I will come in a vehicle of my own. And you will all say, you come in a car and you talk about environment. Right? But if I have to take a metro or take a bus, I will have reached another you know, one more hour later. That is a part. I could have left one hour earlier also. That is also another issue. But the, what I'm saying is, see, the moment you say NGOs, 
you know, civil sector uh, organizations. So many of them have issues with that. Oh, you're all, you come with, you know, Kurta and we are violated, you start protesting. No, that's the image, the moment you say NGOs. You're only, you're not anti development. That is what the first thing people say. When we talk, when we say you're from Eco as well, like, is it a trust institution or an NGO? The moment we say it's a non government organization, we say, oh, okay, what should we do? What is it that you have come for? So they suddenly have a feeling that, you know, we are anti development. No, we are not anti development, at least we are not. But there are certain other, you know, organizations or individuals who have been protesting against Metro for a long time. Most of you must be using Metro. Yes or no? Yes. Do you use Metro, the public transport, cabs, autos? That's the best way. Wherever possible, yes, you should. Even I use it. Wherever possible, we should be able to use it. But there are individuals, organizations which have protested Metro work that has been coming up. They did not want Metro to come because they are going to chop about 500 trees, 600 trees here and there, everywhere. But what? See, Metro should have come 30 years ago. It should have come 40 years ago. So much of vehicular you know, population would have been reduced from then onwards. But even now, yes, we are going to be benefited out of this Metro because imagine how many people travel every day. Do you know how many people use the Metro every day? Any idea, any rough figures? Guess. Now, sir. How many people use Metro? At least in Bangalore, I'm asking. If you're saying something, I can't hear you. No, not that much. No, there are anywhere up to about 8 or 9 lakh. Right now. When the white field is going to be completed and when they are going to connect with Kanpura and also beyond, you know, Nagasandra, Pinya, it is going to be another 10 lakhs who are going to be using. So up to about 20 to 22 lakh people will be using metro. So that many vehicles or individual vehicles will come down. So they do not look at these benefits. See, in the long term, the larger interest is to see that you are going to reduce the usage of your private vehicles as much as possible. So they have been protesting against Metro, saying that it is going to chop off all these trees. See, somewhere you will have to let go. You have to make ways for some kind of, this is in the interest, larger interest of the public. And it is for the public transportation system. It is not for you know some individual's home or some bungalow or some you know, institution. No, it is in the larger interest of the public, the society and the environment. You will have to compensate. But at the same time, when you when we say you have to compensate, it is not after chopping, it is much before even chopping off these trees, identified areas where it can be compensated, where you can grow. So while we were the members of the Metro Committee, there was a lot of public uh, you know protest. They say you say 500 trees, you will remove 700 trees and you don't even replant them. So we started saying that okay, we will start planting now. Next year when we have to remove 500 trees, we will plant 5000 and document it and show it to you. So that's what the metro started doing now. Right? They have started replanting, compensating reforestation has already started much before they go into the public uh, what do you say? Where you will have to, the public has to give you the consent. So now this is what Metro is doing. They are identified areas, they are planting, we have also helped them with some of their forestation programs. So there, your question is how you can help us. One is, yes, you will need to create awareness amongst your own college, your institutions, your surroundings. At the same time, you should be an example as well. If people see you cycling, if people see you using the metro and then talking about it, then it makes sense. If you are using the SUV and then you are talking about the environment, I mean, this is hypocrites. And I can't go on preaching you because I myself am using it. 
So you tell me about no use plastics. Yes? No. Every day. Somewhere or the other you use plastic. Right? The plastic covers or plastic bag. But it is bad. How are you using it? It's everywhere. But it's bad. What kind of plastics are bad? Do you know? Those which are below 40 micron thickness. Because it is very difficult to recycle that. It is very expensive to recycle it. Sometimes it is better to just throw it away and use a new plastic bag. So those plastics are bad, discarded. But what about the rest of them? Okay, fine. You are talking about plastic bags, carry bags. Forget that. Okay, you don't use them. There is plastic in everything that you use. You know, ID cards have plastic. Your phones have plastic. Your clothes have plastic. Your shoes, footwear. Your sari or shoes or trousers or whatever. Everything, there is a bit of plastic in it. Otherwise, it, will, it is not going to be so durable. There is plastic, but what kind of plastic, how is it made, can you recycle it, can you reuse it, is it affordable? What I said about the sustainable development policy, the product policy, all these things come into picture. But the problem is when you start using the single-use plastic, then you throw it. What happens, so, so what happens if you use you know, these plastic bags? What is the problem, do you know? They are not biodegradable. Correct. Any other thing, any other issue that you have with plastic? You can't reuse them. The you can't? You can't reuse them, the closest thing with plastic bags. The thin plastic bags. Yes. Yeah, that's why it is being banned. That is one reason. You can't you reuse it. It does not degrade. It takes a... Sorry? Animals consume it, they choke on, uh, they choke on those kind of plastic. Right. And then they choke the colors also. The rainwater, storm water drains. But why do you throw it there? Don't you have, you all said you use, you know, you segregate waste and all these things you said. Then why is it lying on the road? Why will the animal consume it? If you have not thrown it there, then how will the animal consume it? So unless you throw it there, it is not going to be there. So who is the culprit? You are the plastic. So why are you playing with plastic? In fact, if you have to stop complete usage of plastic, then you have to stop using fossil fuels. That's better only diesel, diesel, gas. It's a byproduct of fossil fuels. So if you actually stop petrol, or if you are going to stop uh, plastic, Right, then comes how are you going to use? What are you going to use? What is the fuel that you are going to use? You all have you all have vehicles, all, even the public transport uses diesel. Some of the petrol is the only thing which is you are running on electricity. So if you are not going to throw away plastic here and there, so you should be first of all sensitive. You need to be aware, you need to have a system where you throw the plastic, then why are you blaming plastic? Let it be. Imagine if all the aeroplanes or all the buses were completely made of only iron and steel. How much fuel that would have present? Sixty percent of the aeroplanes are fiber and high fiber, high density fiber and plastic. Only forty percent is the metal. Imagine if the entire hundred percent was metal. How much fuel that would have present? It would be worse than using plastic. Are you treating plastic waste? Okay, it is very easy for us to you know simply say and without understanding all these things, but somebody is calling you for a protest, okay, go there, buy plastic. You don't even know what the consequences are. You don't know whose fault is it. So when we say ban plastic, these are the issues. When you talk about plastic, what is the alternative then? Any suggestions? Paper bags. You can't carry Italy somewhere in paper bag. You tell me, you can't even carry your pasta in, in a paper bag. 
basically like uh, there is this new thing in Tirupati so they need plastic bags so those plastic bags can be reused like plant it in a pot and the plant grows up why don't we implement it in all plastic bags instead of just giving them exactly that is why I want you to also talk right <laughs> share these Many of them might not know. What he's saying is there are different types of plastic. There is a biodegradable plastic. Even if you throw it on ground, even if you all of you carelessly throw plastic on the ground, it will still be degradable. Including me. Even if I have thrown. As a boy, probably even I would have thrown chocolate wrappers here and there. But when we were starting, I mean we were getting a little more sensitive. Our parents told us about these things. Yes, then it changed. But I think what he said is biodegradable, it's a therapy he said. Biodegradable plastics are there. It's made of corn and starch. It is available. Do you know? Some of them are saying yes. Yes or no? Is it a form? Yes, no. So why don't you use them? Try to find out where is it available. He says it's there in Tirupati. It is in Dharmasthana, Tirupati. It is also there in uh, Shabrimalai. It is in uh, Mumbai. It, in fact, it actually started in Mumbai. That's the biggest uh, hub of this biodegradable plastic. So we have these things available. So technology also has to be made use not only for your cell phone, WhatsApp, and Instagram, but also for such things, right? Anything else that you can suggest? Yes, somebody else. Yes, please, please. CNG is good, it can be an alternate, CNG, but the only problem is the production. The product, it is not available like your petrol and diesel, and it is not easy also to transport it. So that is where the cost will go up. But is there any other alternative from petrol and diesel? Solar is, but you can't have a panel on your car and go around everywhere. Electricity, but electricity will drain much more. Electric vehicles. You are talking about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, is it uh, better than fossil fuel? I mean, petrol and diesel vehicles? Sorry? How many of you say yes? Electric vehicles are better than fossil fuel. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You say electric vehicles are better. So the rest of you say fossil fuel, petrol, diesel vehicles are better. Yes, no. Yes. Can you tell me how is it better? Using petrol or diesel vehicles is better than you say. Sir, we're not saying it's uh, better, but all I'm saying is that uh, we're not in such a situation where we're generating electricity through other means. We're using the same fossil fuels to generate that electricity to run our electric vehicles and then we are saying that uh, we are not emitting those gases. So, <coughs> I don't see how we're being productive. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, for electric vehicles, you need lithium, batteries. Where is lithium coming from? Again, you have to mine. It is there in the earth, just like iron and batteries. You have to start mining, so now there is fresh mining. It's already happening. Fresh mining is taking place. Right? For lithium, that is happening in Mandya. Between Bangalore and Mysore, there is this place called Mandya. There is a lot of lithium available. People have already started mining. So the fresh mining for lithium is going to start. All around the globe, not just here, all around. It is. It looks and sounds cleaner because there is no sound and there is no gas or exhaust. So it suddenly looks very clean. No gas, no sound, I mean the sound of engine, carburetor. So, people feel that electric vehicles are better. 
if these batteries are being made, like you said, the same fossil fuels are being used to manufacture the battery. So it's a double whammy now. You are using this fuel to produce batteries. You are also mining to get lithium to produce these batteries, which is going to be fitted in the cars. And it is not that you are going to fit them in the same cars. It is not like you are taking out the regular engine and fitting this engine or the battery. So we have to again have new cars for that. So the cost of manufacturing these batteries is way beyond your imagination. You will buy a battery, you know how much, if you have to replace the electric vehicle battery for a car like a Suzuki Swift or some moderate car, not a high-end car, just a normal, regular, moderate, medium-sized car like a Swift or Swift design, something like that. If you have to change battery, you know what the battery life is? One year? Eight years. Depending on the car, they usually take yes. two years for the per car. Yeah, it is about three to four years. On, a, on an average, yes, three years for sure. Four years if you are using it well, if you are maintaining it well. If not, it can even go in about two years. If you have to replace it for a car like Swift, it costs somewhere between two and a half to three lakh rupees. How much? So if you know, I mean, please let me know if, if there is a device cost, I don't know. But my understanding was it is about 4.5 to 3 lakh rupees per battery for another 3 years or 4 years. If you maintain it for 5 years. But some of the high end batteries are for about 8 or 10 years. But when you replace it, the battery is also going to cost you the same. Another 6 to 7 lakhs or 8 lakhs. But how are you disposing it? When all these things are fine, now only you dispose it. Is there anywhere that they are going to dispose these batteries? There is going to be lead, mercury, lithium. If you replace lead, fine, you still have mercury, you still have lithium. Can you reuse lithium? No. So then what happens? It is very dangerous if it is in the soil. It is worse than plastic. Plastic, at least you can identify, put it as put it somewhere else. Lithium, you can't even identify. It is even worse. And, I mean, I am saying, if you are taking care of all these things, then it is a clean fuel. Right from the start, that is, from what are you producing these batteries? What is the cost? What is the environmental cost of this? And then what is the cost of running it, operating, maintaining it, and disposing it? And these batteries will not run more than three to four years effectively. And you can't, you know, overcharge them. It's just like your cell phone battery. You overcharge three, four times, five times, the life of the battery starts declining. Because you have already overcharged. It doesn't happen in the same way. Putting more fuel, it doesn't, I mean, there's no problem with that. I mean, you can fill it only so much. So the problem here is there is complete lack of understanding of how, what is the production cost, the environmental cost, the running and the disposal cost. So who is going to check this again? Where is the law? Do you know that even to own a vehicle in Singapore, right? Do you know this? That you can own a car in Singapore very easily? Yes or no? So we do have a legislation in place. E waste management uh, rules 2016, and then we have an amendment also with respect to 2019. So don't we have, a, have a, a legislation? So which, which does provide all this? Uh, there are certain authorities in place which do uh, check uh, regarding this. It is there, that's what I said. It is there on paper. You don't even have enough charging stations, first of all. Where is the recycling unit? Just you know, I am not arguing with you. I am just telling you what I know, what I have read. First of all, the charging stations are not in place. Secondly, where is the unit? It is on paper. Even air pollution laws are on paper. You have to have your emission checked every six months. 
Now it's for what? One year? Six months. Who's checking? Do you even know whatever the vehicle that you have checked in the center, emission testing center, is it doing the right thing? You have a certificate, that's all. Has it done it the right way? 90% of them are not right. You are only because you have an emission certificate, the cop will allow you. But if you go back to the emission testing center, you check his, you see how he would have calibrated. It will definitely show within the purpose device. Whereas it is not. There is a 15 year old vehicle, 17 year old vehicle that is there in Kupi Darwar, where I keep going. That still shows emission level below, below the permissible device. The engine is not in good condition. That is how we test it. Because we have an emission testing center at my friend's garage. He's, he showed me this is the reading. It was 10 times more than what, should, what it should be. So how is it showing proper, you know, below permissible, permissible limits in the emission testing center? So, there are a lot of loopholes. I mean, there are so many issues like this which we can go on talking. But until and unless somebody has to go there, check his emission testing center and then report it to the government. But then somewhere, these people are hand in love. You go and compare it to the government and say, yeah, yeah, we'll take care of it. Nothing happens. You will buy them, you will get away. People will still, you know, continue to use the emission testing center. Nobody is going to know. So, there are a lot of loopholes. I understand. But just because there are loopholes, it doesn't mean that we can't bring about this change. Only those who will really be able to address this issue at the grassroots. Now, don't tell me, you know what Vedder looked like in Bangalore? It was on fire also, some time ago. There is huge frothing, fire, that means heavy metals. If a lake is on fire, that means there is so much of heavy metals in that. So it can catch fire. So what happened to Vedanta Lake? The National Green Tribunal, the NGA, find the state government find on that cross for not taking care of this lake. This was happening over the last eight years. Three years back, they said, you are not, you have not taken care, this is the fine. So where is the 500 crore gone? So some people argue, would say that this 500 crores can be used for <coughs> cleaning up the Bedandur. Some brilliant, you know, brilliant said, we can use this fine road, find us. We will use this fine roads to see that Bedandur Lake is revived, restored, cleaned. So it came back to the state government. Right? Now we have the final course. Every day there is some or the other work happening. So it has come down to about 250 crores now. In the government kitty, treasury. Some said we have to build the wall, some said we have to clean the channel, some said we have to have bio enzymes to be done. In the sense, bio remediation. So about 200 to 250 crores have gone already. Who is saying only because we are there, we no people who are working on these things, I will know. So like this, but if the same thing, if the NGT had said, no, we are going to have a panel, we are going to have constituted committee which will look into this, only then these actions, these activities can happen, we would have taken care. That 500 crores which keep available, at least 250 crores which have just been siphoned off by some of them, the local corporator will come, the local MLA will come, the local MP will come. Each one will have their own vested interests, and these things are going on. <coughs> so I think there's quite a bit of information that has gone exchanged. Thanks to all of you for patiently listening to me. Right? If, if there is anything else that you wanted to know, no problem, that's okay. <laughs> He was, he's very happy that finally this is over. Yeah, yeah, please. Sir, why do cities like Nikkor and Mumbai, which have a better place management of infrastructure than Bangalore, even though Bangalore is more developed than these two cities? See, there is a political will to do that. 
you go to Chandigarh, even when you go to Chandigarh, it is the same thing. Right? You go to, for example, certain parts of Mumbai are so clean. But you don't have to go there because you visit mostly the other areas, other areas. We will come back. If you are going around one, for those who stay there, right? So indoor, Bhopal, and there is one more of you, Jamshedpur, has an excellent waste management plan in place because the corporates have also supported the government. There is a political will. They want their city to be clean. You go to Mysore, it is much cleaner than Bangalore. It may not be a big city, but for the level that it has grown, they are taking care of their city. See, that is because the MLA from that area, the MP from that area, they want their cities to be clean, they want their places to be clean. Here there is a, it's a good coffee. Here people want most of the corporates, I am to say, but most of the corporates want more waste to be thrown in Bangalore. Because they all own about 10 to 15 trucks, they are all deployed by the BBAP, each truck gets paid 10,000 rupees. Because in the number of trucks, more number of trucks, more amount that you get. So more of that happens only if there is more garbage. So it is again a vicious circle. So if the so-called environment minister or the urban development minister says nothing to it, this has to be taken care at any cost, then things will be in place. Some of them are there. See, I am not saying all the politicians are bad. No. At least because of the good ones, we are still surviving here. So there are people who are trying to make a difference. I am not saying all of them are bad. You gave the examples of indoor. So that means there are still good people there. They are trying to make, you know, bring in this difference. Make a difference, bring this change. Yes, that is why, I mean, the only answer is the political will that is there. So why don't we, now that the automotive industry is moving into, you know, hybrid systems, I think it was back in 2010 when uh, Hendrik Fisker, who quit Aston Martin and started yes. his own company called Fisker, where they used solar panels to power uh, an EV motor in a car, and I think it was called the Fisker uh, Ocean or something like that, yeah. and that was back in 2010. What if we continue using a form of hybrid energy, which is off, also powered off so, uh, solar energy, till a point where nuclear fission becomes stable enough to run on cars? Do you, do you see that being an um, aspect in the future that we can look forward to? Definitely. See, even the hybrid vehicles that are there today, I think Toyota and Suzuki have, they have these hybrid vehicles. But they, these hybrid vehicles, where they have, it runs on fossil and petrol and electric, the, uh, they don't require separate charging stations. The petrol engine charges the batteries. So you don't need to have a separate you know, charging station for that. Or, the only thing is, it's a hybrid. So as you said, if, they, if it can be done with the help of the solar, then it will definitely be a most wonderful option, the cleanest form of you know, engine that will be running on uh, solar. If, if such kind of a, you know, technology can be Yes, absolutely. There is a car like that, but it's too expensive to be mass-produced. That, that is where. See, finally, finally it boils down to the cost. You and me can pay a lot, able to afford that. But if there is mass production again, the only thing is when you produce more, the, the whole theory of you know, mass production where the cost comes down, but somewhere you will have to break even. The only point is where they look at the the break of period has to be much lower, much lower. That doesn't happen all the time. You know, it only clicks with, clicks with certain technologies, but not everything. Right? But this is definitely, certainly, I think that is the way forward, in fact. That's a good point that he has made, but how many of us know about it? No, even if we don't know about it, there is this technology can be, you know, uh, popularized and promoted everywhere, it can definitely be we alternate to whatever, even electric vehicles, so which are being made. So we can definitely replace that as well. Thank you.
Samuel Pérez Zayn Sarri, na hora da partida, Colinzio Pérez Zayn. See, first of all, we need to know what the problem is. Most of our urban lakes, in city, in the city, if you go around, you take the samples, test them for different parameters. It is mostly the sewage that is entering. If you go to the industry level, it will be chemicals or effluents that are entering. You cut that first, or you treat it completely, primary, third, and secondary, tertiary levels, and then you discharge. Then it is fine. Until and unless you do not stop the direct inflow or discharge of effluents or the sewage from houses in the residential areas. No matter what you know, the lakes are not going to be clean. So this is the first and foremost thing that you need to know. Once you have taken care of the pollutants or the contaminants or sewage entering into the lakes, the lake you leave it for you know one or two years, the lake will automatically come back to its original position. This happened, especially during the COVID, some of the areas where we saw that a lot of other migratory birds started coming back into Kapan Park, Lang Park, Nati Kere, these areas. They were never there because no traffic, no people were not moving around. It was actually very good. COVID should have continued. Not affecting us, but in a sense, it should have, that threat should have been there. See, now there is no threat, people are again moving around. So, the first and foremost is that. But there are certain, sometimes what happens to the channels that carry the rainwater are also blocked. The second thing is to see that all these channels are cleaned, strengthened, and you also need to have the right kind of species that will attract bees, birds, butterflies, because the overall lake ecosystem should be intact as well. But the problem with our lakes in Bangalore or any of the cities is that the sewage and the effluents enter into them without any treatment. If that is stopped, 80% of the lake re uh, no restoration and 80% of the battle is fought. Yeah, yes. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Trubi Trivedi. Sir, my question was with respect to sustainable development. A while ago we talked about sustainable development and today while there is recession coming forward, one of the most talked about industries is electronics because it is said that even if the recession is coming, one of the industries that will boom even in recession is electronics because at this point there is no way we can live without gadgets. I mean in this room also more than people there are gadgets. So uh, when it comes to electronics, there is also a huge amount of electronic waste which has been tackled very illegally at this point. And countries at this point are not looking at how to tackle e-waste, rather they are playing a blame game which recently there was a talk in UK, I am not able to recall the person's name, but he said that uh, China is blaming UK and UK is uh, USA and USA is blaming China for producing so much of electronic and you know the waste thereof but then we are using it everybody if china is producing products all of us are using it and everybody is uh, yes. you know gaining benefits from it rather than playing blame game what should countries do or we as individuals do to reduce or dispose of e-waste properly rather than illegally being treated <coughs> See, as I said, illegally, see, the only thing is when you say, when you are saying illegal, they are actually trying to reuse the products in a much more efficient way. So the only thing is, the way that they are doing it is not, not that it's not sustainable. They, they do not meet the standard. Right? If you go to some of the markets, you go to Shivaji Nagar, there is huge electronic waste, you know, down the aisle. They will take out everything and reuse it. But the way it is done is not ethical. It does not come under the standards. So if the government can actually give them the incentives for, you know, because they have the brain, they might not have the capacity to invest 
in the technology where the waste is going to be discharged or waste is going to be taken care of. They don't do that because it is not going to be cost effective for them. If it is not cost effective, it does not work out for them. So if the government can pitch in and say that yes, you have the brains, you have the technology, but only thing is make sure that you do not pollute, set up a you know electronic waste uh, disposal or management unit for such people. See, great game in the sense China and US, US and China is going on for the last God knows how many years. And we are all the beneficiaries. Most, I think 90% of the products that are that is here is from China. Whether it is iPhone or Samsung. It's all you know, produced in China. All of it. 90% of it is from there. They have the capacity to produce. And we are the biggest market for them. And it's cheaper. So if we can have see it is there on paper again. The problem is the electronic waste management, as you said, the policy is there. 2016 and then 2021, it was the device, abandoned. It is still there. But who is using it? Who is doing it? Who is implementing it? So there is no enforcement. If at all, if you go to Shivaji Nagar and tell them, pick up the best players and ask them, give them a proper facility, they will be able to do it. So that's what you might say. There is no point in simply blaming one another. Rather, get the technology. There are corporates, even under the CSR, you know, the corporates can help such initiatives. If the government doesn't have funding, they, the corporates will definitely be able to support. If not one corporate, three, four of them can definitely support such uh, initiatives. So the only point here is that how the products are also made. That China has to take care. Right? If the products are made in an environmentally friendly way, it is fine. But it can't be 100% completely you know, environmentally friendly. It is impossible to do it. There is some cost, there is some environmental cost and damage that has to be either taken care of or that has to be compensated. I, mean, I don't know if I have addressed your question, but this is what I think the government should also do, the corporate should also, you know, chip in. And as institutions, maybe there is a different role for the institutions for also. Like for example, if you have there is a shell R&D center that's there in Bangalore. They are completely you know, looking at how to run these vehicles on hydrogen fuel. You know, hydrogen. So that R and D that's the reason why we are at the Ukrashi airport. So somebody is doing some research somewhere, but only once it is commonly available, publicly accessible, is where we will all get to go, and if it makes you know, if it is financially feasible. Alright, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.